Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter. Uh, we finally got our actual somewhat set set up, um, so that's really exciting. We are going to be going over what happened for December 2019 in Paleontology, and if you are waiting for the year in review, shouldn't be much longer. So let's begin our review. So in November, there had been a leak about a dinosaur that was mummified, and while this study isn't on that dinosaur, it does help show just how valuable mummified dinosaurs can be to the sciences. Specifically, the fossilized soft tissue that isn't skin can still help show some of the proteins that would have existed in dinosaur flesh and essentially dinosaur meat. By looking at a mummified hadrosaur, researchers were able to show that some of the proteins from the original meat and flesh of the animal could have been preserved. And this is different than from the skin, which is where most of the study in mummified dinosaurs has occurred. What the study shows is that the flesh and meat of dinosaurs, even hadrosaurs, which were very distantly related to birds, very much resembled the chemical composition of birds, meaning that yes, dinosaurs might have tasted like chicken. This is very important because as I have mentioned, the hadrosaurs were very far separated from the birds by over 180 million years of evolution. What this means is that all of the dinosaurs may have had this kind of chemical composition in their meat and muscle which is very unique and helps the birds become so successful with flight today. And while hadrosaurs didn't fly, that same kind of very efficient muscle type may have helped them become as successful as they were. The early theropods are very diverse, but finding something that can be defined as an ancestor or close to an ancestor of one of the later groups that was more dominant during the Jurassic or Cretaceous is very hard. Even Cryolophosaurus only seems close to the base of where the split would have been between things like the Silurosaurus and the Allosaurus, which isn't very specific. And that makes this new find coming from Argentina even more special. Asphalto venator Vialdati is one of the most primitive known Allosauroids, or at least it's probably an Allosauroid. It has a large mix-up of different traits that are found in many of the other groups of early theropods. And this helps to show just how diverse and exactly how related some of those groups may have been. The combination of traits that are very similar to both the Allosauroids and the Megalosaurs helps to mix up our understanding of how exactly many of these early theropod groups were related. Previously, before Asphaltovenator had been discovered, it was thought that the Allosaurs and Silurosaurs were more closely related than the Megalosaurs, which would have been a separate group that was also very successful throughout the Jurassic and parts of the Cretaceous. However, Asphaltovenator having this mixture of Allosauroid and Megalosaur traits really does mix this up. What it suggests is that the Spinosaurs aren't within Megalosaurs, as was previously thought, and were their own distinctive group. But then also it shows that the Megalosaurs and the Allosaurs were much more closely related, with the Metriacanthosaurs somewhere in between that. This entire clade has been grouped within Carnosauria, which was previously just for the things like Allosaurs and then the later Carcardonosaurs. What this means is that the Silurosaurs, which would lead to eventually the birds, but also raptor dinosaurs and Tyrannosaurs, are much more separated from animals like Allosaurus and Giganotosaurus than previously thought and that the evolution towards the birds was very distinct from the rest of the clade that made up the theropods. For a single fossil to so revolutionize our understanding of how different theropods were understood is going to be controversial. However, a few other researchers have stated that they have entered data from Asphaltovenator into their own data sets for their own studies, and that what they're finding is in agreement with what the researchers found in this study meaning that it does seem very promising that more research done on this species and this specimen will help reinforce the idea that the Megalosaurs and the Allosaurs were more separate from the Silurosaurs than previously thought. Very, very occasionally, and only in the best preservation, the central nervous system of certain arthropods may be preserved. The reason I say may is because there is still a lot of debate about it. A new paper looks at two different arthropods coming from the Cambrian and suggests that yes, this is the central nervous system of the animal, however this will still be debated. What some other researchers are suggesting is that rather than being the central nervous system of the animal, that it's actually the gut cavity leaking some of its fluids and causing the dark staining on the rocks, which some people are interpreting as a central nervous system. 
rather than being a true central nervous system, as we wouldn't be as likely to expect in the fossil record. However, what the researchers of this paper suggest is that we do see certain traits that do align with what we know of the nervous system of even modern day arthropods. And this is a few different things. First, that the gut and the esophagus of the animal actually pass through the central nervous system. Essentially, when it goes up to the eyes, it makes an entire loop, and then the gut cavity goes through that loop and lays on top of the nervous system of the animal. And this is something that is found in modern arthropods as well. From butterflies to ants to even grasshoppers, they all show this same kind of thing where the gut cavity passes through the nervous system before continuing along the rest of the body. There's also what appear to be ganglion, which are essentially smaller bundles of nerves that exist in each segment of modern day arthropods and also appear to exist in certain segments of these primitive arthropods, meaning, again, this may be a central nervous system. The main issue with these papers is that it's very hard to prove definitively that it is indeed that nervous system, and so more study with many more specimens is going to need to be done. Ceratopsians often have elaborate headgear, and Triceratops is the most famous of these, but it's separate from the group that we're going to be talking about today, which is the Centrosaurs. Of the Centrosaurs, Styracosaurus is one of the best known of this clade, with its very, very elaborate frill being one of the most distinctive features of the species and of the genus. However, where most depictions of it show a very even presentation with both sides of the frill being very symmetrical, a new fossil shows that wasn't necessarily always the case. The fact that at least one specimen of Styracosaurus shows asymmetry indicates that at least the Ceratopsians with more horns may not have been as symmetrical as the ones with fewer horns, like Triceratops, may have previously indicated about the entire clade. What the same find may indicate for the species and the genus is far different. What it may indicate for the genus is that Styracosaurus may have even crossbred with something like Centrosaurus, which was very closely related and may have been the direct ancestor to Styracosaurus. They are both found in the same formations after all. The problem with this idea though is that different specimens of Centrosaurus and Styracosaurus don't necessarily line up in the time frame of the different formations to make it likely that they would have been an antigenetic series, essentially one species evolving directly into another. Rather, the authors suggest that instead of this, Styracosaurus had a diverse breeding pool, and that would have been more likely to cause this kind of asymmetry that we see in this fossil specimen, rather than crossbreeding, which would be more difficult and more unlikely to happen. Another new paper suggests the oldest parental care in the fossil record coming from the Carboniferous period. The find consists of two specimens of a new species of amnio, Dendromia unamakensis. The two specimens were found within very close proximity of one another, with the smaller specimen appearing to be within or under the arm of the larger specimen. The two specimens are fossilized within what appears to be a hollowed out carboniferous tree stump, which to me at least doesn't indicate parental care. Rather, what it indicates to me is more likely both specimens attempted to seek shelter within the tree stump from something else in the environment that would have been a greater hazard. And this could have been something like a flood, as you would need to bury the tree stump in order to get these specimens to fossilize. So as much as the researchers are trying to suggest that this is the oldest evidence of parental care, there's still going to be a lot of debate about this find, and it's not necessarily going to be all one-sided, depending on what other researchers feel. Personally, again, I don't feel it's necessarily completely definite that this is parental care. Rather, I think it was just a very opportune and very unique fossil that is very interesting but not quite as interesting as the researchers suggest. This find though, again, like I said, is unique, and so it will help inspire a lot more discussion on when exactly parental care evolved in the fossil record, and it is a very good indication of how paleontology works, with a lot of discussion happening from many different people, so feel free to leave your opinions down below as well. Complex forests are very well known from the Carboniferous period, in fact, the word Carboniferous comes from the amount of coal that was found coming from this time period in the fossil record. But these Carboniferous forests weren't the oldest forests. New fossils coming from the Devonian of New York show that even some of these older forests from the Devonian 
had incredibly complex trees with very complex roots. The roots have been associated with fossils of Archaeopteris, which isn't to be confused with Archaeopteryx, which was a dinosaur closely related to birds. Archaeopteris was one of the most dominant trees of the Devonian, and from these new fossils had very complex and seemingly very modern roots. Within the area of this discovery are other roots from other trees, which show that they weren't nearly as complex as these other more modern roots were, and that these more modern trees were able to become more successful into the Carboniferous, and were able to very much change the environments and the atmosphere around them. These trees became very successful, and created so much oxygen that it was at almost 35% during certain parts of the Carboniferous, and it all started from these Devonian trees, which were already preparing to have very modern roots, much like today's trees. Which brings into consideration how much forests can change the environments today, and why we should be sure that we are protecting and managing them in a safe and sustainable way. In order to become a fossil, the animal needs to be buried rather quickly, and this often requires a lot of water, as you need to be able to have a lot of water moving sediments in order to cover the animal before it starts decaying. And there's a lot of water in the oceans. What this means is that the oceans preserve a very good record of different fossil life during different times of the earth. What this means in mammals is that the whales are one of the best preserved lineages of evolution over time, as the whales were already going into the water as early as 50 million years ago, just a few million years after the extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs. However, later than this, there's still a lot of other transitional forms that we can still study. The animals that are the best examples of this are often things like Pachycetus, which show some land-based adaptations and some water-based adaptations. However, even once the whales became fully aquatic, there are still new studies showing more transitional forms as they became the modern whales that they are today. As an example of this, a new study looks at a new species of whale, Aegecetus Gehenne, coming from the late Eocene, about 35 million years ago, of Egypt. This species shows the reduced hip proportions that would have led to a more tail-powered swimming condition rather than leg swimming condition as found in earlier versions of the whale. In Aegecetus, we see the reduction of the hind limbs, which previously would have been used for a paddling swimming motion, and the enlargement of different tail vertebrae which would have helped the tail become more dominant for swimming, much like it is in modern whales today. This new species is just one of a long list of different transitional whale species that we know of, but they do help show how we got the whales that we have today, and just how complex the evolution of whales from Pachycetus into modern day animals like the blue whale or sperm whale has been. The Pseudosuchians were some of the most dominant predators of the Triassic in the American Southwest. Animals like Poposaurus, Arizonasaurus, or Postosuchus all were very dominant and even outcompeted many of the dinosaurs in the region at the time period. And this is because many of the theropod or early theropod dinosaurs that existed in the southwest of the United States during this time period were very small and very fragile, such as Coelophysis, which was very hollow boned and wasn't necessarily going to be taking on something as bulky as a Poposaurus. A very well preserved Poposaurus is a great example of how these animals were able to outcompete the dinosaurs for most of the Triassic. Poposaurus would have been about six to seven meters long, making it much larger than the contemporaneous dinosaurs that it would have lived alongside, such as Coelophysis. While the skull of this fossil is missing, the hips helped to show how they were still bipedal, much like the dinosaurs, with greatly reduced forelimbs, and this would have helped them to more rapidly catch prey when hunting. The find places more emphasis on the hip differences between dinosaurs and Pseudosuchians as being one of the main reasons that led to the dinosaurs' success. The more efficient running and walking gates of the dinosaurs would have helped them become more successful in the small and medium-sized carnivore niches up until the end of the Triassic, where the Triassic-Jurassic extinction allowed them to become the most dominant predators on the land. The reason I want to specify on the land is because a lot of the Pseudosuchians did become much more aquatic, and by that I mean many of them evolved into the crocodilians we see today. 
While not all of them did stay in the water, such as Barusukis from the Kemkem beds of Cretaceous Morocco, they did dominate the water and very few of them did leave it. But the fact that they did do so well on land during the Triassic and even the Cretaceous and parts of the Eocene shows that the crocodilians aren't necessarily limited to just water, especially when they have a few million years of evolution on their side. Hang on. Danny? Yeah? I don't think we can record in here. It is so echoey. Like, you just my voice. How's the door open? Hello? No. Uh, like, listen to this. Like, I, I know. I was hoping it wouldn't be too echoey. <laughs> Damn it, it was gonna be so cool! It was.